I'm grateful to be here this morning. Friday, some of you may have been, who is driving on Friday during the torrential downpours? Anybody driving in those torrential downpours? It was insane. I was driving on 70, doing 60, 65 miles an hour. Everybody's kind of doing the same speed. <clears throat> and it was, there was so much water on the highway, I could feel my, my wheels hydroplaning every so often, you know? And so I kept slowing down, slowing down, but I'm still doing probably 60 miles an hour. And I'm real tunnel vision, you know, I can barely see the road, the, the tor torrents are coming down, and out of nowhere, uh, a vehicle comes and just crawl right in front of me. I could have reached out and touched it. I thought it was going to hit my front quarter panel. He went, he or she, I don't know, went from just, I mean, how, how they missed, I don't know, Lord might have let him go through the vehicle, I'm not sure, but he went veering right in front of me. He was broadside to me, and I, I just, you know, just instantaneously reacted. I popped my brake just a little bit and steered, trying to get behind the rear end. And, and in all that, I look over, and he's looking, or he or she, somebody's looking straight at me. And they're snow plowing the water. The wa you know how when you snow plow, it just kind of blows up off? The water is blowing up off the side of his car, and he's doing 60 miles an hour sideways. And the next thing I see is I see him drop down, and I'm still trying to get my car. You know, I see that. I'm still trying to get my car under control, and, and uh, oh, man. <clears throat> so that was, uh, that was definitely a near-death experience for me, for sure. But not something I had planned on, but I'm grateful to be here this morning. And I want to read, so before we get into our topic, <clears throat> I want to read a few verses from Psalm 119. And, um, and, and, then, and then dive into what we're going to be covering this morning. But <clears throat> Psalm 119, beginning in verse 33, it says this. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. And here we go, turn my eyes from looking to, at worthless things and revive me in your way. Let's pray this morning. <clears throat> Grace Heavenly Father, we come before you. I am personally grateful to be standing here, to be alive today. I uh, have known several people just over the last couple months that have been in serious wrecks, um, serious accidents, Lord, where they've physically been hurt in some way. Lord, I, I thank you for your care, your uh, your providence there, Lord, and just ask you to watch over our time today as, as we pray before. Be with Pastor Brett, be with the days, be with the Ingersolls, with their new babies, and uh, just, just bless this time. But Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, <clears throat> if we can switch over to the other presentation. Is it going to work? There we go. All right. So some of you know, uh, I do a lot of apologetic stuff. I teach on biblical apologetics. How do we know the Bible's true? I deal with a lot of cults and, and things like that. Why, why do we not believe the same thing as Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or Roman Catholics, things like that? What does the Bible teach compared to those ideas? And so I thought this morning, because I had so much time to prepare, we would do a little excerpt uh, from maps. And by the way, I, so I did, I did DVD series, and I put these in the library. So Maps from the Ancients, we're going to do a little, little bit of that this morning. And uh, the Light Project, I look at eight cults and world religions. These are in the library, so you can check them out. Several have done uh, some Bible studies, walking through them and stuff. But <clears throat> I want to look at, the reason I, uh, a number of years ago, as some of you know my, uh, our story, mine and Noel's story, we came out of kind of a, a psychological cult. And um, we, were, we were independent, fundamental Baptists, and, but it was really cultish in the sense that it was all based and focused on the pastor, and the pastor was kind of the end-all, be-all. He's kind of like a little god to us. And so we had decent theology regarding Christ and regarding some other things, but not really regarding the whole counsel of Scripture. And as I got out of there, there's a lot of abuses in that setting, and as I got out of there, I ran from God. I <clears throat> uh, didn't want anything to do with him, didn't want anything to do with the church after all that. And, and slowly over time, got into college, the Lord began to draw me back to himself, he's like, here is, here is who I am, right? You can trust me. That was wrong, and, and the scriptures are true. Let me show you. And so <clears throat> I began to study, how do we know that the Bible's true? Because as I was running from God, I was still searching for truth, right? I'm like, I know there's truth out there. Where is it? I, you know, looking at other religions and things like that, and God says, here I am. I want you to see 
uh, that the Bible is true. And so I dove in, and I, I came up with an acronym so I could very quickly explain to people, whether it's in a 30-second conversation or a two-hour or 30-hour conversation with someone, how do I know that the Bible is true? And so I can use this in a witnessing setting. I can use this um, for my own faith. It, it really bolsters my own faith as a believer to know that the Bible is true and can be trusted. And so I came up with the acronym of, acronym of MAPS. It stands for Manuscripts, Archaeology, Prophecy, and Science. And I end with a lesson on the resurrection. How do we know that the Bible hasn't changed over thousands of years? Well, the manuscript evidence shows that the Bible has not changed over thousands of years. How do we know that the history in the Bible is the same as the history that's going on in the real world? Well, uh, archaeology reveals to us that the history in the scriptures is the same as what happened in the real world. As we think about prophecy, right, we think about some, somebody is forth telling, somebody is telling something that's going to happen in the future at some point. Well, the Bible is full of prophecy. And you know what? It gets it right every time. How is that possible? The Bible is written by men, but they weren't just men who were writing on their own. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit, and they were given direct prophecies from God. And so we know that the prophecies in Scripture, whoever wrote the Scriptures knew the end from the beginning, right? We serve the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God knows the end from the beginning. As we, get, as we deal with science, we have a world that loves science but doesn't want to deal with the Creator. We see amazing design all around us. And if I'm in the world, I run to and see that the world has no evidence for where did this all come from? Richard Dawkins says, nothing exploded. And that's how we got here. As I come to the scriptures, I see God is the creator. right? And so <clears throat> as, we, as we dig into this, I'll turn this on. Here we go. As we dig into this, I'm going to just, just cover a few of these bits and pieces, but I wanted to help you understand some of the attacks against the Scripture, some of the calls for us to defend the Scriptures, especially in our own hearts and minds, but also as we're dealing with others. Francis Schaeffer, I love Francis, uh, he said, The primary battle is a spiritual battle in the heavenlies, but this does not mean, therefore, that the battle we are in is otherworldly or outside of human history. It's a real spiritual battle. But it is equally a battle here on earth in our own country, our own communities, our own places of work, and our schools and even our own homes. The spiritual battle has all its counterpart in the visible world, in the minds of men and women, and in the very area of human culture. In the realm of space and time, the heavenly battle is fought on the stage of human history. This is the battle in which we are supposed to be enjoined every day, right? <clears throat> Let me show you some of the attacks that we get to see regularly in the headlines, right? This is from Salon. God as the original terrorist. Six ways the Bible condones horrific acts of of brutality right well hopefully you know if you've, you've been in the word long enough to know that this is not what the bible teaches but this is sensational uh drivel that seeks to draw people and destroy this draw people away from the scriptures and destroy belief in them we see things like good old dan brown with the da vinci code author amazing author right here he is <clears throat> he's paying for 3500 occult manuscripts to be digitized and made available freely online Great, got to love that, right? Uh, no, this is stuff that draws people away from the truth of the Scriptures, destroys the idea that the Scriptures are true. His goal in writing the Da Vinci Code and a number of his other things is to destroy faith in the Scriptures. <clears throat> we see things like in the church, church renames transgender pastor and compares her to Peter and to Abraham. This is in the name of the Lord, in the name of people who claim to believe the Bible, they have transgender pastors, and they're renaming their pastors, claiming to be in the vein of Peter and Abraham. We see Pope Francis. We are not Roman Catholic. Obviously, Roman Catholic, a completely different religion than us. But we see in the, in the Catholic Church, Pope Francis chooses a pro-LGBT priest to guide Lent retreat who holds that Jesus didn't establish rules. There's so much wrong in that one sentence, right? <laughs> Jesus didn't establish rules. I'm pretty sure in the Sermon on the Mount, there was something in there. I'm, I'm not, I have to go back and read Matthew 5 through 7, right? Jesus did establish rules. He has laws. We don't get rid of the Old Testament. The Old Testament carries many of the moral laws that we still hold to today. We see things like the U.S. Episcopal Diocese votes to stop using masculine pronouns for God. 
This is, the, this is the culture, this is the world in which we live. We need to be aware of this because the battle is going on around us and many Christians have crawled into a hole and said, I only care about what happens to me in the next five minutes. <clears throat> we see things, the, the culture right now is full of Marxism and social justice and all these terms. They come from Karl Marx, a man who hated the God of the Scriptures. The Communist Manifesto called for the forcible overthrow of not just economic structures, but of all existing social conditions. His economic theories, Karl Marx's economic theories, and indeed his entire worldview were tailored to fit his theology. Religion, said Marx, is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the sentiment of a heartless world, as it is the spirit of spiritless conditions. It is the opium of the people. Karl Marx, get rid of religion. Actually, he didn't want to get rid of religion. He wanted to destroy faith in God. Richard Dawkins, I mentioned him a minute ago, he said, mock Christians, ridicule them in public, don't fall for the convention that we're all too polite to talk about religion. As a matter of fact, a number of people have started to realize that we have kicked out politics and religion in our daily discourse so much so that nobody can have a conversation about politics and religion anymore. We can't have a, 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 a meaningful, kind conversation anymore. So we get to the screaming levels that we've seen in just the last few days. Uh, with the with the whole uh, Kavanaugh situation um, this dealing with coming back to the church a little bit to let you know the state of the church <clears throat> this is uh, um, from there's a number of things here from church leadership and and Barna and stuff like that read through it but if you're a fairly well-read pastor or church leader you can see the results of a Barna polls and the Time magazine cover story in 2007 that showed that only half of American adults could name just one of the four gospels and even fewer can identify the first book of the Bible, Genesis. We have seen Jay Leno and Ted Koppel make fun of and draw concern that Americans can't name more than two of the Ten Commandments correctly. Now, everybody's asking themselves right now, do I know what one of the four Gospels is? I hope so. Do I know what the first book of the Bible? I, I, yeah, yeah, I got that one, okay. <clears throat> Hopefully you do. Hopefully you can name more than a couple of the Ten Commandments. But this is the state. It doesn't just... It's not just in the pews that are the problem, right? Uh, we see from uh, Francis Schaeffer Institute, 72% of the pastors we surveyed in the last 10 years stated that they only studied the Bible when they were preparing for sermons or lessons. Only preparing for sermons or lessons. They, uh, that left, this left only 38% who read the Bible for devotions and personal study. These are pastors. No wonder we have transgender pastors, right? 71% of pastors said when they read the Bible for study, they regularly just looked for what they wanted and did not read it in context. That's a problem, not reading the scriptures in context. 62% of pastors said that when they prepared Bible studies or sermons, they rarely looked up what they did not know or understand and just winged it. The same percentage also said they regularly read into a passage what was not there in order to make their point. Warning, warning lights, right? Sirens should be going off. <clears throat> Thankfully, our pastor cares deeply about what the scriptures and say, and he, he digs into it, studies it. Francis Schaeffer continues from the beginning. This is, this is the rest of his statement. He says, if we are to win the battle on the stage of human history, it will take a prior commitment to fighting the spiritual battle with the only weapons that will be effective. It will take a life committed to Christ, founded on truth, lived in righteousness, and grounded on the gospel. You see, our primary our primary goal is Christ and Him crucified, preaching Him to a lost and dying world. That's our goal in life. As the church, as His people, we have several different big goals. One of those big goals is making disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples. That's what we're called to do. How do we do that? We preach Christ and Him crucified. <clears throat> Ephesians 6, 14 through 18 says this, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. If we allow <clears throat> this book to be destroyed in our hearts and minds, we've lost the battle. We have nothing else to stand on. This is key to everything. Praying always all prayer and supplication, the Spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. <coughs> so in the next few minutes, I want to go through just a few pieces 
of the manuscripts of archaeology, prophecy, and science, just to give you a taste. Again, manuscript evidence lets us see that the Bible hasn't changed over thousands of years. Archaeology reveals the history in the Bible is the same as the history in the real world. Prophecy lets us see and understand that, the, that the, whoever wrote the Bible knew the end from the beginning, and science lets us see and understand our creator and designer. <clears throat> Some more attacks. Um, I forgot that I had this one in here. Uh, Brian McLaren, uh, who is a, um, claims to be a Christian, Buddhist, Hindu kind of guy. You know, he's been a pastor for years. He says things like this, Scripture faithful, faithfully reveals the evolution of our ancestors' best attempts to communicate their successive best understandings of God. In other words, the Scriptures are not God-breathed, theonoustos, as, as the Bible tells us. These are humans trying to explain God on their own terms. As human capacity grows to conceive of a higher and wiser view of God, each new vision is faithfully preserved in Scripture like fossils in layers of sediment. Pastors like Brian McLaren hate the Old Testament. They hate the God of the Old Testament. They hate the rules that he gave. And uh, <clears throat> so he has to destroy them in some way. Bart Ehrman, uh, a Greek scholar who, who claims that the Bible has been changed so many times it's impossible to know that what we have in our hands is still what, what was written originally. He says, we could go on nearly forever talking about specific places in which the text of the New Testament came to be changed, either accidentally or intentionally. The examples are not just in the hundreds, but in the thousands. Now, it's interesting that Bart Ehrman, when he was really pressed, he, was, uh, he, was, he sat under uh, Bruce Metzger, who was a, a Bible-believing Christian, trained under him. And when he was really pressed uh, on, on really, are these... Are there really that many differences? He said, well, if you put both of us in the same room, <clears throat> we would probably both come out to where there's only a few dozen differences between us. But he likes to make these sensational claims. Just in the, th you know, there's, these changes are in the thousands. Come to find out, most of those are spelling errors. Oh, so you're, you're not speaking truthfully there then, are you? Okay, so... <clears throat> Dan Wallace, he's, been a, he's a great uh, Greek scholar, New Testament scholar, has been a uh, Bible-believing Christian, believes wholly in the Scriptures. Let me explain to you what we have, the riches of the text that we hold in our hands. He says, today we have as many as 12 manuscripts from the 2nd century, 64 from the 3rd, and 48 from the 4th. That's a total of 124 manuscripts. A manuscript is a handwritten document. They didn't have printing machines or Xerox machines back, back in the day, you know, so everybody had to write things down and copy them. So he says we have a total of 124 manuscripts written within 300 years of the composition of the New Testament. Most of these are fragmentary, but the whole New Testament text is found in this collection multiple times. All right. Now, why is that important? We have 124. It doesn't sound like a lot. He says, well, how does, this, how does the average Greek or Latin author stack up? If we're comparing the same time period, 300 years after composition, the average classical author has no literary remains. That means... All the classes, if you're in classical education, all the classes that you're taking in, in college, you know, on all these um, ancient uh, uh, Latin scholars and, or Latin writers and things like that, they don't have, we don't have any of their documents that go back to within 300 years of when they originally wrote. We don't have them. The average classical author has no literary remains, but if we compare all the manuscripts of a particular classical author, regardless of when they were written, the total would still average at least less than 20 and probably less than a dozen, less than 20 and probably less than a dozen, and they would all be coming much more than three centuries later. For what we hold in our hands, we have over 124 from the first 300 years still in existence. That's more than the classical author that we stake our whole schools on have in any way, shape, or form, all right? Compare the Bible with other old books. This is the best document in history, the Iliad, Okay. When was it written, or who was it written by? It was written by Homer, not this one, okay? It was written around 800 years before Christ. How many do we currently have? 643 is an old number. We currently have about 2,000 of them. We have about 2,000 pieces or copies of the Iliad, all right? How many years are, is it from, from the time of the original writing to the earliest that we actually have, okay? Because that's critical, in, in a few years, people can change a whole lot of information, especially if it's being written and transcribed every time. Well, these documents go back to within 
hundred years of the original writing. There's big questions as to whether or not Homer actually even wrote them, okay? But this is the best document compared to the scriptures that we hold in our hands, the best one. All right, let's look at another one. New Testament, how about this? We have several writers, uh, and by the way, so Homer's Iliad is the best document. Most of the classical writers, you heard Daniel Wallace say, have 20 to their name. 20 that we've ever found. Most of them have less than 12. Okay? Homer's Iliad, Iliad has 2,000. Well, New Testament, we have several different writers. It's written around 80, uh, 50 to 100. We have over 5,000. This, this number varies depending on who's doing the counts and how big of a fragment they count as, as one whole piece. We have 5,366. And what is the time from when they were originally written to the earliest that we have? The, the time frame is only 50 years. And there's a chance they're still working on documents and things like that, trying to date them accurately. There's a chance that some of them are concurrent with Christ even walking the face of the earth. We know that Matthew uh, used shorthand a lot. Uh, there's, there's some possibility that we have some of Matthew's original documents. They're working on that. We may not. It doesn't matter whether, whether they're actually concurrent or not. But we have this within 50 years of the time of Christ. Okay? And so this shows us that people are still alive that can contest what's being claimed, right? If, if I say that Jesus Christ rose from the grave and, and 50 years later somebody changes that or 40 years later somebody tries to change that, uh, no, no, Christ didn't rise from the grave, blah, blah, I can be like, what are you talking about? We were all there. We all saw. We all, we all heard. We all knew, right? And so this is very important that we bring this time gap way, way down here to know that what we hold in our hands is accurate. I love what James White says about uh, the, the scriptures. People claim that we've lost. We might, we might be missing some of the scriptures. James White's like, no, we have like 110 or 120 percent. There's so many, so many people that were copying, tried to add things in to make sure that we didn't miss the point of the text. And so some of it is we have to kind of call out what, they, what was added over the centuries. It's not like we're missing something. We have extra that, that people try to make sure, you know, maybe, maybe the name of Christ was, maybe just the name of, of Christ was used, and they made it the Lord Jesus Christ or something, just to make sure we knew who was being talked about, you know. But originally it was just Christ. And so we have all this. We hold in our hands over thousands of years. This text has never changed, and we have the documents to prove it, okay? Now, Let's keep going. Oh, yeah, scorecard. Let's look at some of these. Pop these up here real quick. We look at, uh, it's too fast, right? There we go. We look at Pliny. He was writing. He wrote Natural Histories. The gap between when he originally wrote and the earliest that we had is 750 years. Obviously, much can change in that time. And we have seven of them. Thucydides, he wrote his history. The original gap between when he wrote and the earliest that we found is 1,300 years removed. And we have eight of them. Demosthenes, any of his writings, 1,400 years removed from when he originally wrote to the earliest documents that we have. We have 200 of them. Homer's Iliad, we have 2,000 of them with a 400-year time gap in there. But we come to the New Testament, a 50-year time gap, possibly even concurrent. We'll see as time goes on. 5,366. Now, one thing I didn't mention is that is in the Greek. 5,366 in the Greek. If we include the New Testament documents that we have and allow for other languages that it was translated into, we have over 25,000 of them. 25,000 of them. So this is, this is all the uh, near Egyptian languages and, and different, different dialects and things like that. This is just in the Greek, the 5,366. So we have solid evidence to show us that the Bible has not changed over thousands of years. Now, we get into archaeology. <clears throat> archaeology, again, the scripture records a lot of history. Is that history accurate? Did that actually happen in the real world, or are they made up stories? Well, the evidence is fragmentary um, uh, regarding archaeology. I had the awesome opportunity to sit under Dr. Barry Beitzel. He's the archaeologist who uh, did the Moody Atlas of Bible Lands and uh, had, got to take an ancient Near East archaeology class from him. It was a great class, but... It's estimated there are about 30,000 shipwrecks in the Mediterranean. We've only found about 24. Okay? So we're dealing with very fragmentary evidence. Uh, in Iraq, 5,000 sites have been surveyed, and only 300 have had actual digs. 
It's estimated that if the site of Nineveh were excavated layer by layer, it would take over 8,000 years. That's one site. Okay? So we don't have everything there is to find. We don't have teams that can go out full time and, and just dig, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the field of archaeology started because of the scripture. Somebody who's studying Babylon, he's like, I wonder if we can, if that was, if that really existed, if we can find that. He went over there, started digging, took him a couple expeditions, started digging, and found Babylon. Okay? This book is the foundation for archaeology, and now archaeology supposedly is used to destroy, destroy faith in the scriptures. <clears throat> Only a fraction of what has been unearthed has been published. Um, in the back halls of all the museums and things like that, you still have drawers and, and shelves of things that have never been published, never been put out for anybody to see, never been cataloged. Okay, So we're dealing with very fragmentary evidence. It's estimated that in spite of the archaeological revolution, we may only have one twenty-five thousandth of all that may be seen. But what is so awesome is that in that one twenty-five thousandth, we have amazingly uh, biblically confirming evidence. One of my favorites is the black obelisk of Shalmaneser. This is a huge one. This is about an a 18 by 18 inch square uh, column that's about six feet tall. And uh, it talks about, it depicts the five kings conquered by Shalmaneser III, the king of Assyria, from 858 to 824 B.C. Each side portrays the five kings in postures of submission to Sh uh, Sh Shalmaneser. Sorry, i got to get my tongue untangled here. But the second one shows Jehu in the house of Omri, king of Israel, and records just as it does in the scripture. You go to 2 Kings chapter 10, and you're going to see Jehu uh, in, those, in those kings there coming and giving their homage, their alms, to uh, Shalmaneser. Now another connection here. Let's use some of the specifics here. Uh, discovered around 1846, it commemorates the triumphs and accomplishments of Shalmaneser. Uh, the emperor of the Assyrian Empire, uh, contains reference to Jehu, and it includes a picture of him bringing gifts to buy off his powerful Assyrian emperor, and even in includes a lot of writing underneath each of these. And in one of these little depictions, I think it's that one right there, Jehu is seen bowing down to the king. Huh, isn't that interesting? Uh, another one is Sennacherib's prism. Let me give you some of the details here. Sennacherib took over after Sargon II died in 705 B.C., Okay. King Hezekiah, the king of Judah, paid tribute to Sargon II for almost 20 years. And after, after Sennacherib took over, Hezekiah revolted. Okay, you can read about all this. 2 Kings 18 through 20, 2 Chronicles 32, and Isaiah 16. Fascinating story, amazing work, a uh, uh, picture of God's care for his people. But this prompted then Sennacherib to attack Lachish, Jerusalem, and 44 other city-states in Judah. I mean, he just went on a rampage because of this rebellion. Hezekiah almost gave in. His father had given in. Hezekiah almost gave in, but he stayed true, believed God would, would tr uh, protect him, and uh, he did what God told him to do, and God protected him. Sorry, we're jumping so quickly here, but as we get into prophecy, right? Prophecy reveals that whoever wrote the scriptures knows the end from the beginning. One of my favorite prophecies is about the ancient city of Tyre. And because of time... Let me see here. All right. So Tyre, let me tell you a little bit about Tyre. The city of Tyre was heavily fortified, very prosperous, uh, when Joshua brought the Israelites into the Promised Land around 1400 B.C. It's a Phoenician city. I don't have a board up here to, to draw it out, but Phoenicians were seafaring people, and so they would always look for a place where they can have a, a mainland city and a, a city out on an island. So they were looking for an island that wasn't too far from the mainland so they could bring their ships in, they could dock their ships, and then they could ferry that material, that trading material, over to the mainland and then send it out to be sold throughout all the lands. And they'd ferry stuff back and forth between the island and the mainland city. Well, around 970 B.C., the king of Tyre helped Solomon build the temple by supplying cedar and fur logs. So Tyre and, si uh, Tyre and Sidon usually hear him in conjunction, but Tyre is doing pretty good at this time. But by 750 B.C., they had become extremely wicked. So Isaiah, in chapter 23 begins to prophesy against them. And by 590 B.C., Ezekiel gave a very specific prophecy that we can see in chapter 26. And I'm not going to read it. I uh, would like to read it with you, but <clears throat> let me give you some of the highlights. 
One of the highlights, verse 8, that Nebuchadnezzar is going to destroy the mainland city of Tyre. Remember, they have the mainland city, and then they have the city out on the island. Then we see that many nations are going to come against Tyre. We see that she's going to be made bare like a rock, flat like the top of a rock. I don't know about you, but, you know, moving rocks and big timbers around is not something I enjoy doing on my weekends, right? So especially in ancient times, they don't have bulldozers. They don't have things like that to move big chunks of rocks and, and, and lumber around. So it would be rare that you would completely and utterly destroy a city. This is a massive claim that's going to happen. Why in the world would a, would a city be completely destroyed down to its foundation? Fishermen are going to spread their nets over the site. That's pretty specific, right? Uh, the debris is going to be thrown into the water. She's never going to be rebuilt and never be found again. The original city will, be, will never be found again. Well, here's what we find in the layout, what happened after this prophecy. We see a couple years later, Nebuchadnezzar lays siege, lays siege to the city. After a 13-year siege, Tyre makes terms to accept the Babylonians' terms. When Nebuchadnezzar walked through the gates, he realized the mainland was mainly deserted and the people had moved to the island portion of Tyre. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is coming from where? Babylon. Does Nebuchadnezzar have a, a big navy that he can run out and attack him with? He's land-based. He's a land-based guy, right? So he's like, ah. So he destroys the mainland city, and uh, the, the island portion of Tyre remained very powerful for a number of years. Well, then during a war with the, with the Persians, after defeating Darius III at the Battle of Issus, Alexander the Great comes south, and he asks all the Phoenician cities to open their gates and to deny the Persians their use to the fleets. So the people of Tyre refused to do this, so Alexander lays siege to the city. Get this. Nothing's left on the mainland portion from Tyre. It's all out on the island. Alexander, he's land-based for the most part as well, but he takes over, he's taking these fleets, right? And he says, hey, I want you guys all to give me your fleets. I don't want the Persians to be able to get them. Give me your fleets. Tyre says, nope, we're not doing it. So he goes to the mainland city, and he takes all the stuff that made the buildings, and he throws it into the water, and he makes a road out to the island. He makes a road out to the island. It's like a mile out there. So then he can attack from the road and from the water at the same time. Okay? Tyrion's thwarted his first attempt. So he goes back. He gets a navy, uh, 223 ships. And so while attacking from the mole or the road, um, he's able to attack and finally take it over from both places, okay? So we see that the larger part of the mainland city was made flat like the top of a rock. We even have stories historically where people were sweeping the dust from the mainland city and throwing it into the water. Are God's pro predictions going to come true? Absolutely. And when he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen exactly how he says it's going to happen. Tyre then became a fishing city. Nets were spread there until the Saracens came in and destroyed what was left in the 4th century A.D. Today, the, you, can, you can go there and see the present day of Tyre, uh, city of Tyre, there's a massive city that's built on that road, and I'm sure they've ex widened it over the years. But they've built from the mainland portion all the way out. It's crazy. It's still, that, that portion is still there. Uh, messianic prophecies. A challenge for you to do is all through the Old Testament, we have prophecies that pointed to Christ. He's going to be, uh, you know, uh, son of David. He's going to be born of a virgin. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. Walk through Matthew. Matthew was a Jew who's writing to the Jews about Jesus, the king of the Jews. So Matthew is trying to highlight every time Christ is fulfilling a prophecy. All right? So part of your Bible study, make one of your Bible studies at some point. I'm going to go through Matthew, and as I'm reading, I'm going to jot down every time Matthew points out a prophecy that was fulfilled from the Old Testament. Okay? Just a, just a fun uh, fun study to do. I'm going to give you ten, the first 10 of them. We see uh, early on the son of David. Ma Matthew points out he's going to be the son of David with rights to the throne. He's born of a virgin. He's born in Bethlehem. We're going to see that Christ is called from Egypt. We're going to see there's a reaction uh, similar to when children were killed in Ramah. Okay? Uh, we see that Jesus is from Nazareth. We see that John the Baptist would prepare the way. We see that he was a prophet of fervent preaching. Christ was. Christ is the light in the darkness. Jesus is the healer, all right? And we can just keep going on and on and on through Matthew. Now, what do we do with those prophecies? Let me show you these prophecies. You don't have to be a math scholar. You'll understand this pretty simple when we get to it. 
when we take all these prophecies, okay, we look at he's going to be born in Bethlehem. It said in Micah 5 2, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Zechariah 9 9, he's going to, the king is going to ride into, uh, present himself as king on a donkey, okay? Uh, Zechariah 11 12, we see that he's going to be thir- sold for 30 pieces of silver. We then see that that money is going to go to the temple and a potter. We then see in Psalm 22 16 that his hands would be pierced. By the way, this is almost a thousand years minimum of of 600 years before uh, um, crucifixion was invented this prophecy is given we see isaiah 53 7 he's not going to make a defense even though he's innocent we see isaiah 53 9 he dies with the wicked and he makes his grave with the rich who are the wicked that he died with yeah two thieves whose whose grave was he put in joseph of arimathea right psalm 22 16 uh, that one's doubled there. Shouldn't be. Anyways, so we, we take all these and we put them together. We figure out what are the probabilities of this happening to any person throughout history, okay? Uh, there, was, there was a professor, Peter Stoner, who, did, who went, um, he taught at a Christian university, and he wanted to study what are the probabilities going on here with these prophecies. And he took a number of his students, over six or 800 students over the course of a number of semesters at the university where he taught, and they looked at what are the probabilities of these ha- things happening to any one person at any given time in history. Okay, so they said the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. Well, what's the chance that one person is going to be born in Bethlehem all through history? And they said, well, we're going to say it's one chance in 100,000 people. So one out of every 100,000 people, probably way more than that, probably way more than that, but one chance in 100,000 people that you're going to be born in Bethlehem. Well, what about a king presenting himself on a donkey? Okay, there was a time where some kings presented themselves on donkeys, but over time we'll say, they said, we'll give the chance one in a hundred, probably way more than that. Okay, that number should probably be a hundred thousand, but we'll give the skeptic the biggest possible chance. We'll say one chance in a hundred that a king is going to present himself on a donkey. And you go on, 30 pieces of silver, what's the chance someone is going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver? Well, they said that chance is one in a thousand. So you go on, we take their numbers that they put together, and we come up with this big number right here. One chance times 10 to the 28th. And you say, Rex, what do I do with that? Okay, that's a bunch of numbers, a bunch of zeros. I understand, don't worry. What we do is we take this, we take one chance times 10 to the 28th, and then we, we don't just say, hey, what's the chance of this person happening throughout history? We say, what is the chance of this happening for all time in history? Divide that out, and we come up with this number that's a little bit less. It's one chance times 10 to the 17th. One and you put one with 17 zeros after it. The chance that all eight of these things are going to happen to one person. All eight of them, one person. Let me explain. What is the chance? How do we understand that better? Well, if I took Eric here, okay? I took Eric and I blindfolded Eric and I filled the state of Texas two feet deep full of silver dollars. Okay? And I took one of them and I marked it with a red X and I threw it out in Texas and I mixed it all up so that silver dollar with the X on it could be anywhere in there. I said, Eric... Your job. Mission impossible, right? Go and find that silver dollar with the X on it while you're blindfolded on your first try. That's a chance that one person would fulfill all eight of these prophecies. Now guess what? There's over a hundred prophecies that Christ fulfilled. So we could keep going. And exponentially it just keeps growing and growing and growing. The next level, I think 16 prophecies, uh, I'd have to verify this, but if I remember right, 16 prophecies, we would have to make a ball the size of, uh, with the radius of distance from the earth to the sun. A ball that big. Okay, the radius is the distance from the earth to the sun, a sphere. I take Eric and I blindfold him, but I also put him in a space suit. I fill that ball full of silver dollars. I mark one with a red X on it. I put it out there, I mix it all up so it could be anywhere, and I send Eric out to find that silver dollar. Okay? This is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who we worship. He knew the end from the beginning. God knew what was going to happen. As a matter of fact, he planned it all. Can we trust the scriptures? I say yes, 100%, over and over and over again. Science, I love science. You don't have to be a scientist to love science. You can just love the amazing design in the world around us. 
uh, the Eiffel Tower. We see French, Gustave, French engineer Gustave Eiffel. He went to a specialist on human anatomy, Hermann von Meyer. Meyer had studied the human femur or thigh bone, which connects to the hip. And this bone is the largest bo bone in our body and has an unusual off-centered ball that fits into the hip socket. You break that bone, it's a big deal, right? Well, the bone's curved head has many internal bone fibers called trabeculae, and these bone fibers crisscross each other in layers and are precisely aligned to withstand the varying forces of tension and compression. You ever seen the Eiffel Tower? Got all these crisscrossing beams running through it. He based the design of the Eiffel Tower off of the hip bone and the, the fibers in the, in the hip bone. Now we see this happen over and over and over again. We see scientists studying nature to make things. They're studying um, butterfly wings. How does the color on a butterfly wing, how do we see that vibrant, vibrant color? If you didn't know, there's little panels on the butterfly wing, and they go up and down, and depending on the way the light hits it, it changes the color. They're studying that so they can make high-def televisions, so they can make the the, the, the definition come through at higher quality, better colors, more realistic colors. What did the, what did the butterfly do to design those, those color panels on its wing? Imagine how much time the butterfly must have spent in the lab trying to figure that out, right? And it goes on and on. Uh, the lobster eye, they studied the lobster eye so they could better uh, build a uh, deep space telescope to see uh, thousands of light years in, out into space. The lobster eye. Where does that come from? It doesn't come from millions of years of random chance processes, things just evolving and smashing into each other and exploding and somehow forming into something new. It comes from our amazing designer God who has created the world. Romans 1 tells us that he reveals himself to everyone. When I go up to witness to someone to share the gospel with them, I don't care if they're an atheist, I don't care if they're a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Mormon or whatever. They know that the God of the Bible exists because creation reveals it to them. Romans 1 tells me not only does creation reveal it to them that the God of the Bible is real and true, but that they are in rebellion against Him. So I can stand there confidently when I share Christ with someone knowing that what I'm doing, when I'm preaching Christ and Him crucified to a lost and dying sinner, regardless of their background, I am, I am speaking God's words to them. Hey, you need to repent. You need to put your faith and trust in Christ and Him alone because it's the only hope. All this other stuff, this is just, it's around, right? This, 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 is, this can be faith building for a believer. It can even be used in a witnessing setting, but very, very sparsely because my goal is to call them to repentance. My goal is to, to, to bring Christ to them. One of my favorites, the bombardier beetle. Oh, man. This dude has a cannon coming out of his rear end. He can shoot this cannon any direction, 360 degrees out of his body. And he's got a couple chambers in there that have a, uh, create a certain chemical. Another chemical is added to it. And just before it leaves the cannon, uh, another chemical is added to it that ignites it, and it shoots out. And it's, if, you, if you slowed the sound down, it sounds like a whole bunch of pops. Pop, 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 pop. But, you know, he shoots like a frog in the mouth that's trying to come eat him or something like that. Something that's trying to attack him. You know, he shoots it and shoots this it's boiling hot steam, okay? Where does he get the information to put these, to make sure these chemicals are in his body in the first place and then that they get added in the right way? What happens to the first time if the bombardier beetle supposedly doing this on his own and he puts the wrong chemicals together at first and he blows up, there's no more bombardier beetle, Right? The answer is that our amazing designer God created them. He created them exactly the way he wants them to be created. Just as he created us exactly the way he wants us to be created. We could go on. I don't have time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. We could talk about dinosaurs and all that stuff. I want to end with... <clears throat> don't have time to get in the resurrection. This is... Uh, this is um, Larry Talton here. He's talking. Talking. He says, "I'm reminded of the Scottish philosopher and skeptic David Hume. A lot of a lot of students in college. A lot of people follow Hume. But David Hume, who's recognized among a crowd of those listening to the preaching of George Whitfield. George Whitfield was the famed evangelist of the First Great Awakening. Someone asked him, 
I thought you didn't believe in the gospel. Hume said, I do not. Then with a nod toward Whitfield, he added, but he does. I want to leave you with that today. We're talking about the reliability of the scriptures. <clears throat> do you burn brightly, standing firmly on the scriptures, preaching Christ and him crucified to anyone that you're able to in a lost and dying world? Because that's the goal here. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can solidify in our minds over and over and over again that the Bible is true. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal that to us as well. But ultimately, where am I with Christ? And if you're not in Christ today, if you've never repented of your sins and put your faith and trust in Christ, that's the most important thing. We can study history, we can study prophecy, we can study all that stuff, but the important thing is where are you with Christ? And if you're in Christ today, if you, if you have put your faith and trust in Christ and in Him alone, what are you doing to tell others about Him? What are you doing to make sure that others hear and know about Him? We're going to step into communion. We didn't have time to get into the resurrection. But, but we come and, and we remember this time because Christ told us to remember it. And our, our God is not, not laying in a tomb somewhere. We don't worship a statue that reminds us of that God. We worship a living God who, who rose from the grave, who lives today, the one who we are supposed to be proclaiming. And so as we come together, we spend this time, we want to remember that we are here because of Christ and the work that He did on the cross and saving us from our sins. And so we do this in remembrance of Him. So let's pray, take a little bit of time, we'll, we'll pass, the, pass the elements out, and uh, we'll do this in remembrance of our amazing God, okay? Pray with me. <clears throat>